B-B-O-T. The next session is called Creative Visions, and we're doing something new this year. We are bringing on people who uh, are doing really interesting work. So we have two sessions like this. Come on, uh, come on up, and it's going to be led by Nick D. Martino, Nick D. Martino Consulting. And Nick uh, has been, is a real veteran in this industry. He's been around quite a long time. He knows everybody, and he understands the concepts and the technology uh, through and through. So I'm very proud to have him here leading this session. The various people in this session include Paula Byrne, who's the managing director at Push Button, which is a company in England, and I'm sure she'll introduce herself. She's doing very exciting work, um, some of the best work really in the world. And Dustin Califf, who is executive producer at Tool of North America, has done some very groundbreaking work with the iPad, and he'll talk about um, that. And Michael Payne, who's the director of experience design at Intel, and he's going to talk about uh, some of the experience design work that they're doing uh, behind the scenes to affect everything that, that you operate today. So thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Can you sit down? The mic on? Hello. Good morning. Um, as Tracy said, I'm Nick DiMartino. I um, know a lot of you from my days at the American Film Institute. And I was, I was on stages like this, in fact, this very stage, back when Tracy started, um, providing a showcase for uh, the content side of this incredible equation of interactivity that we've all been working on for the last 20 years, in my case, and probably for you as well. Um, today, I had an easy job because uh, the folks that are up here uh, to present to you uh, were curated by Tracy, who knows, you know, vastly more people than I think anyone I've ever met. Uh, but the, the through line here, the creative visions idea is that um, in addition to talking about the plumbing that delivers all this stuff to you and all of the different platforms, there is something that the consumer cares about and that's what's on the screen. And some of that has to do with interface design, user experience design, uh, the way humans interact with those screens, the behaviors that you can observe, um, and how that interacts with all the plumbing to make sure that it actually is delivered in a seamless way. Uh, it's a lot more complicated. It continues to get more and more complicated. And the three folks up here, as you'll see, have some um, head start that they can give you in terms of their insights about some of those issues. Uh, we're going to start with Paula from the UK. Paula Byrne founded uh, the London-based digital agency Push Button in 2002 upon leaving B Sky B, where she headed up Sky Active, which was one of the early red button uh, successes. Uh, and it was certainly an inspiration for all of us in this country who kept trying to make interactivity work, and they'd done it in the UK first. Push Button designs uh, and builds interactive content and services for companies like the BBC, ITV, Disney, Microsoft, Foxtel in Australia, Turner and Virgin, and many others. So why don't we take a look at what Paula has to show us today? I should have got a box up here, shouldn't I? Right. Thanks so much for inviting me along here today. Um, I've been coming to TVOT right from the very beginning, and it's incredibly flattering to have been asked by Tracy to talk about a number of issues. And I'm not seeing what's on screen. Right? Good. Okay. So Tracy's asked me to talk about what's right and wrong about user interfaces today, why user interface work is so important, how technology is beginning to really impact more than ever before on user interface design, What's our view on where we think user interfaces are heading? And how is the role of user interface teams changing? Let me tell you a little bit about Push Button, just very briefly. Um, we started off working with legacy platforms, like satellite TV platforms in the UK. The work I'm going to talk to you about today is more about what we're doing in the unmanaged world uh, with over the top. We're doing a lot of work delivering to newer platforms like connected TVs. Uh, we're working delivering uh, services to consoles. And all of these new platforms that we're working on are giving us a whole host of different user interface issues that we're needing to grapple with. Let me turn up the music here and show you the kind of things we're working on.
Okay, so let me tell you as well. Everything you're seeing is designed for TV, and we've got a massive TV out there, and you can come and see it in all its full glory. Right, first question was, what's right and wrong with user interface today? And obviously, it d differs depending upon the platform you're talking about. And we've all had issues where we're wrestling with legacy platforms and designing around legacy platforms. But let me tell you, there is actually an awful lot of good work that's out there at the moment. But I think one of the problems that's happening is people aren't really thinking holistically about designing with TV as a central hub and with the associated devices, the companion devices, the tablets and the phones, there's a real family of devices. You know, often you see UX designed on one platform and a totally different UX for the brand designed on a different platform. People are looking at companion devices as standalone content delivery de platforms instead of being complementary to the core TV viewing experience. And I really believe that we need to be focusing much more about bringing those two platforms together. And I think an existing problem with UX at the moment is I don't think some of the existing commercial business models really allow for great UX to shine through. And I'll be talking about this a little later on. Push Buttons a technology agnostic company, which gives us a really good view on so many different ways of working and delivering content and services to customers. Sometimes we work with framework type applications. So a good example of that would be something like the Microsoft Media Room product. Now even with fairly old boxes, fairly old Media Room boxes, there's actually some really good interface work that can be delivered if you play to the power of the device. And the great thing about those kind of IPTV devices is that they have hardware accelerated graphics. And what that means is one thing, it means speed. And speed is the one thing that I learned from my days working on satellite cable TV platforms in the UK that customers absolutely demand. Viewers want speed. And so when we were looking at building services on, this is the iPlayer service that we built, which is a, a VOD player uh, for the BBC, the public service broadcaster in the UK, we came up with lots of clever ways of using the hardware acceleration that the platform allowed so that even when you're having to st scroll through very, very long lists of content, you're actually getting to the content you want quickly and you don't feel like you're waiting, you don't feel like it's really lagging behind. You mask those delays and you get people to the content really, really quickly. And if you do that, you give the viewer a great experience, they get to the content quickly, and at the end of the day, that's all that they really want to do when they're getting into these services. And here's another example of an over-the-top service delivered via a managed platform. This is a media room style platform. Again, speed. If you can do anything quickly, you're going to enjoy the experience far more. So the reason that we believe UX is so important now is that viewers are really changing the way they consume content. It's not just about watching on a TV screen that's maybe linked up to a set-top box. It's about coming in at the point of entry that suits you. It's about a multiplicity of devices. We're building services at the moment for such a wide range of devices, and as I said before, trying to make them work holistically and making sure that the interface works seamlessly across the device. And we believe in future people are going to want to see managed and unmanaged content and PVR content all wrapped up in one EPG. And that's a lot of the work that we've been prototyping and looking to for the future. So this is a service we've built uh, for purposes of demo to show how you could take content that is based upon something you might have got from your PVR, it might be coming over the top, but basically Planet is something that begins to understand exactly what content you like, what content you've watched before. It allows you to look at trailers of that content and ultimately it allows you to choose the content because it will be placed in front of you to be watched at certain times of day. So Planet learns with you. It learns who's watching TV with you. And if I was watching TV with this gentleman over here, then it would present a different set of TV viewing options than if I was watching on my own. 
We've also built companion devices with a family of interfaces that sit around the same, the same basic user interface principles. Well, the question I was then asked is how is technology impacting on the work we're doing in UX? And I suppose the one key message I would get across to you is that with the chipsets that are now available at our disposal, we are building the most amazingly fast and responsive interfaces that are giving great, great creative possibilities. And what we're doing as a developer, and what lots of people I think are going to be doing much more in the future, is actually working with the GPU within the system to actually make the fastest possible interface. As I say, navigating quickly is the key thing. But the other thing that that allows is for interfaces that can tilt, that can move around, that can have 2D and 3D perspectives. Let me show you some of those. So the key principle, when I've stood up and talked about user interface before, so the key thing is to keep the user interface clean and simple. Up, down, left, right, just using a remote control very simply. Well, the difference with the new chipsets is that we've got a new axis now. We can move content backward and forwards. And that allows you very quickly to get through a lot more content than you ever did in the past. So if you can see here the concept of kind of layering, where you have content that you can move in and out of, and that can tilt around you. So you see here, sometimes you, you feel you will be in part of the user interface. Two worlds, ...and fully capable of deciding your own destiny. The question you face is, which path will you choose? Okay, again, I please would ask you to come and have a look at these out on a TV screen, because all of these services have been designed to really take advantage of the box, the, the boxes that are prevalent at the moment, and the chipsets that are increasingly prevalent. And finally, I just want to say a little word about companion devices. As I said right at the beginning of my presentation, what we're trying to do with companion devices is make them link in to the TV experience. So we're going to be shortly launching uh, in a telco uh, in Canada, a remote control that is actually working on your iPad, uh, on your iPhone, and will actually pair up to the set-top box so that you can actually use it as a remote control that pairs with the box. And we're also creating incredibly, hugely fast interfaces using chipsets like the Intel 4100 that really allow customers to take an experience on their iPad and then liken it to the experience. So take the elements of the touch gestures that you use on your iPad and start reflecting them in the services that you'll be seeing on screen. So in terms of where things are headed, anybody who's working in UX at the moment has to understand the different technology platforms and the capabilities of those platforms. If you don't get that right, you won't get a fantastic user experience. You need to utilize the GPU. You have to, have to really get deep into the GPU to understand what's the quickest possible interface. And then you need to take that experience and use the kind of work that we've been doing with gesture control, uh, using motion gestures, to actually ensure that the interface experience is what viewers are going to be expecting. We believe that UX will become the differentiator on many platforms. Technology is no longer the barrier. The technologists have done their job. Now is the time for creatives to step up to the mark. Uh, services will be driven by the brand rather than the technology and really think about all the multiple devices and how they interact with each other. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you, Paula. Um, next up is uh, Dustin Khalif, um, who's the executive producer of Digital at Tool of North America, where uh, one of the projects he worked on, which I think he may show you a little of, is called Touching Stories, I think it may have been, if not the first, one of the first apps that I downloaded on my iPad when I bought it a year and a half ago. Um, it's four short films that use touch and interactivity to drive the story. 
And it really put me in mind uh, way back when, in the early days at AFI, uh, when QuickTime was first starting, it had interactivity built into it. And a guy had this great um, application that allowed you to change the point of view of the story as it was being told. And you know the technologies advance, and the storytellers um, take advantage, as Paula was saying, of the capabilities of the devices. But it really takes the creative visions from people like Dustin to make it happen. So. Take it away, Dustin. Well, thank you, and uh, hello, everyone. As uh, Nick said, my name is uh, Dustin Califf, and I'm the executive producer of Digital at uh, Tool of North America. I don't know if we're seeing the slide up there right now, but uh, I'll just keep talking while I give a little background. Is that uh, th there? You go, and it's uh, really wide, and and backwards. <laughs> So I'll just keep talking and just assume that we've got so many technologists in the room that something will get figured out. Is, uh, you know, Tool, we're a hybrid production company. What that means is we produce live action and interactive content. And the way our model is set up is that we, like a lot of commercial production companies, we have a roster of live action directors. What makes our model a bit different is that we also represent a number of high-end digital artists as interactive directors across all sorts of digital platforms. So what I mean by that is, I'll give you a few examples, is uh, one of the interactive directors we have on our roster is a guy by the name of Graham Devine. He uh, is the person who ran iOS gaming at Apple. So he specializes in interactive storytelling for the iPad and multi-touch devices. Another interactive director that we have is a guy by the name of Carlos Uloa, who created Paper Vision 3D. So he's one of the top developers in the world for creating interactive stories for the web. Uh, you know, somebody else that we work with is a guy named Evan, Gr Evan Grant, who's the founder of Seeper, and they were at the forefront of architectural projection mapping and interactive installations. So we pair these up with our live action directors to push forward the idea of creating nonlinear interactive stories for interactive platforms. So I am going to uh, start with, well, here we are today at the TV of Tomorrow conference, and you know, when Tracy approached me is that, uh, I really got excited because this is a different audience for me. I'm, I'm used to talking to the advertising industry and the creative industry and you know, I, I really, one of the first things I did was go check out what the agenda was for day and what people were gonna be talking about. And as a content creator, I found it really interesting that we're gonna be talking today about you know, content aware TVs and automated content recognition and you know, the amplification of television. And you know, my focus today is I wanna talk about how we can all work together. You know, the technology is great but how do we create content specific for these platforms? And I'm not talking just having an app you know, sitting on your television, but creating engaging content, the next generation of storytelling for these types of platforms. So uh, you know, I wanted to start being the, one of the content producers in the room is, uh, you know, I have to admit, I feel like as content producers, we've become a, a gluttonous bunch. Uh, you know, we are typically shouting out from the, you know, the mountaintop, content is king. And Content is king, but I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. I think that there's a dual-headed king, and that's content and technology. And you really need the two working hand in hand in order to do the things and, and evolve the kind of storytelling that's out there. And what I want to do right now is really walk through the creative process on three interactive kind of projects that we've done. And I, I'm going to focus on really talking through our creative process and how we marry together our technologists with our directors, our visual storytellers, to produce these. So the first one I'm gonna share is Touching Stories, which uh, Nick had mentioned, and this is an iPad app. And the brief background on this is that uh, it was early 2010, the first iPad hadn't come out yet, and our live action directors are often, often working on, in isolation of each other. They're working on their own projects. And they had often said to us they wanted to collaborate together on one project. So before the first iPad came out, we said, this seems like a wonderful opportunity. Why don't we push and just see from a conversation standpoint, what could we do leveraging the unique, you know, unique interactivity of the iPad? Let's see what we can do with storytelling with the you know, uh, accelerometer, with the you know, multi-touch, with the GPS. What can we do? So we challenged our directors. And the first thing they did was start coming up with high-level concepts. We didn't, the iPad wasn't out yet, and we couldn't get our hands on one from Apple. So we had to start kind of basing it off of the iOS. Think about just core stories. And then from there, one of the first things that we did, and this is marrying together our technologists with 
our visual storytellers was going into rapid prototyping. So the first weekend the iPad came out, we started to go into prototyping and started testing some of the interactive elements that we wanted from our stories. This is showing an example of we wanted to see if we could do in-video browsing um, uh, you know, directly inside of the video experience. And the reason we wanted to do this is the internet browsing would kind of complement the stories and the videos that we were allowing for. So this was just us prototyping and you know, going through a lot of different rapid prototypes. Once we kind of knew what we could and couldn't do, this is showing a very rudimentary story tree, but this is something that we do on a number of our projects. And really what we're trying to show here is what are the storylines and what are the key interaction points that map back to every one of those storylines. So I'm showing you, this is from a demo I'm about to show. This is the Sarah and Jerry film in, the, in this iPad app. And what's on top is, you know, the, the core setting, open on Sarah sitting on a couch watching TV. And then what happened after that is that all of those orange boxes are the key interaction points. So if you shake the screen, the next action that you see is she falls off the couch. And then it goes right back. So you're seeing how all these kind of interact with each other. And let me share it with you now. This is a demo of one of the films. This is the interactive film, uh, Sarah and Jerry. Sarah and Jerry by Sean Erringer is a playful take on a few characters in a house. But the twist is that they have entered a zone where they are being controlled by the user. Shake your iPad and Sarah falls off the couch. Swipe the toilet and Jerry gets a dose of hot water in the shower. Touch the painting on the wall to hear what the portrait has to say. Time to leave. I'm ready. Yep. Think Truman Show, oh but you're the one pulling the strings. It's, it's on. Uh, okay. Wait, Ultimately, wait. Sarah and Jerry figure out the joke Jerry. is on them and decide to get their revenge. You gonna go golfing in your towel? Not exactly. <clears throat> Jerry! <laughs> you like that? So obviously he uh, figures out at the end that it's you, the, the, the person on the iPad who has uh, been messing with his, their lives, so he crushes your iPad. So uh, that was the touching stories. I'm going to share with you two other projects. Um, this one I wanted to share, it's a project that we did called David on Demand. And uh, this one kind of centers around the idea of social viewing. And what I mean by that is leveraging the chatter that's happening on Twitter and Facebook and the real t having that impact the content in real time. So the background on this is that the advertising agency Leo Burnett Chicago approached us for the Cannes Advertising Festival, which is basically the biggest conference of the year for the advertising industry. And they wanted to generate buzz. So the way they wanted to generate buzz is that they asked us, they had an idea. And their idea was, we want to send our creative recruiter, David, over to Cannes, and we want to stream it live for six days in a row. And every single action that he's doing will be controlled by requests happening in real time from Twitter. So this was going over to Cannes France. We had a full production. And I'm going to talk you through the process a little bit. But let me show you how this kind of uh, came down. Lear Burnett hosts the Wildfire Seminar every year at the Advertising Festival in Cannes. Every year, the topic changes. Wildfire 2010 focused on spontaneity and modern marketing. Lear Burnett wanted to promote the seminar, maybe with a poster or two on the croissette. We gave them this instead. This is David On Demand. Everything I see while I'm in Cannes, you see. Right over there, that's a Twitter feed. Everything I do, you control. You tweet me to go jump in the fountain at the Martinez, well, that's what I do. I'm your I'm your slave. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. David On Demand, the world's first Twitter-controlled man. David On Demand went live on June 23rd, 2010. And that is when all hell broke loose. For six days and 144 consecutive hours, David had to do everything the internet told him to do. Are you kidding me? He accepted over 20,000 tweet requests from 130 countries around the world, accommodating as many as he could, live in real time. At great peril to his health, his hair, and his sobriety. David's celebrity grew daily, earning news coverage from within the industry and outside of it. A man who will do anything, you tweet him. On the wings of love, oh, only the two of us asked me to sing a love song. the internet. <laughs> David Perez, what the hell are you doing over there? 
The Wildfire Conference was a runaway success, and the project generated 100 million media impressions and 3.5 million Twitter mentions, making David, by far, the most talked about person in Cannes that year, and proving the power of real-time creativity. Still, not everyone was impressed. What's going on? Yes, where are you from? I, I'm from the internet. Where are you from? Where are you from? The internet. What? The internet. What is it? It's on on the it's in the the World Wide Web. Yeah. How are you guys? So um, you know what I want to talk. He he still has that tattoo today, by the way. Uh, and, uh, you know, really what I want to talk about is from some of the challenges that we faced. Uh, you know, this was in Cannes, France, and we had to stream live for six days in a row. And, you know, one of the solutions that we had for it is we found a portable streaming backpack that the way this worked is it had six 3G cards in it. And it allowed us to never have any downtime, or I should say there was 10 minutes of downtime the entire six days. And the way it works is it powers together. So if, if one of the carriers has a weak signal, it switches over to the other 3G card. And if all of the carriers have a signal, you get a much more powerful connection that's driving back to, in this case, it was the web, could be a TV, could be whatever. So that's one of the solutions that we had. And then the other is, I think, when you think about these types of projects, you have to think about how can we still make this engaging when you're still having you know, viewers uh, participating in changing the storyline. And this is a picture of what I call base camp. So every single morning, our creative team, our production team would meet up, and what you see on the wall is basically the outline for the day. So we would have a loose outline of the story arc that we wanted to have throughout the day, but we'd still keep it flexible enough to allow for the audience to be impacting what the story was happening. And I think that's an important thing. You never want to lose control over that. You still want to be able to have the storytellers tell the story, but still keep it flexible enough for the audience to be able to impact what was happening. And, you know, the last part that I just wanted to share is, uh, you know, the reason I've got Alyssa Milano's Twitter page up here is that we also had to think about, you know, the getting the word out. And the way we got the word out is that when tweets were coming in, we also were analyzing the social media footprint of each person. So Alyssa Milano actually tweeted in, and as long as she had a reasonable request, we prioritized that. And the reason we did is, She's got 1.6 million followers. And by doing that, when we followed her, her, you know, when we responded to her, we knew she was going to retweet that back out to her audience. And that's what helped us kind of get that groundswell of, of audience. And I think that's an important thing to kind of consider when you're trying to do one of these types of projects. The last one I'm going to share is an uh, interactive music video that we did for the band The Cold War Kids. And uh, when we were approached for this, the band wanted a music video. And we came back to them with the idea of, Who's really talking about music videos anymore? Let's push it a little bit and think, go through the idea of creating an interactive music video. So uh, I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit. Actually, this is, I, I do like sharing this. This is literally the first sketch that our director came to our technology team with. And I think this kind of shows you, one, how simple his idea was. He basically just wanted you, the viewer, to feel like you were in the recording studio with the band and that you could remix the song in real time as you were watching the band perform. And that's easier said than done, but this was the sketch and this is what it ended up becoming and I'm gonna let it play out here. How's it gonna feel in the summer? In an effort to re-energize the world of music videos, Tool created a revolutionary and groundbreaking interactive music video for the band, The Cold War Kids. Giving fans unprecedented control of the music. Conceived and shot by the award-winning director Sam Jones, Fans can mix different versions of the song, audio and video, and turn band members on and off in real time with over 600 unique combinations possible. We were forced to invent and develop a cutting edge pseudo streaming solution with innovative video streaming and compression approaches. I've got the edge, I feel the sting, like falling into the deepest sleep. With a high bandwidth connection, 
This entire interactive music video experience is possible without a preloader. With simple mouse controlled navigation, the user can experience, experiment, and share with other fans from around the world. So for something like that, the big challenge, and you can imagine a band is never going to allow this if the music is ever out of sync. So how do you keep everything allowing the user to kind of control the different you know, songs? We had an acoustic version, a reggae version, a dance version, and the original version. And this is what I want to talk about next, which was the technology side. And granted, this lived on the web, but this could have very well lived on any platform and could have lived on the, uh, lived on the TV. And you know, one of the first things that we tried, and, and this is what we're typically doing from a technology standpoint with our directors, is what I call iterative development. So the idea of just kind of try it with something, learn from it, and then keep going, but do it fast, do it while we're still in the content phase. And the first thing we tried was a, a progressive download version, which for us was great in the sense that you were never out of sync, but the issue was from a computer processing standpoint, it was way too heavy. So it would automatically crash your browser, and the next thing you know is you weren't really able to uh, you know, watch the video anymore. So we kind of learned from that and went to the next thing, which was using a flash media server and doing a live streamed version. And the pro on this is that it didn't have to download the entire video. There were 16 different videos that we had. Instead, we were able to uh, jump right to the part that you needed, but there was lag time when you actually were trying to mix everything in real time. So there was like a, a little bit of a buffer. So that didn't work for our purposes. The music got out of sync. So what we ended up doing is marrying the two together and creating kind of a pseudo streaming version. And that's what you see here. And that's what we ended up using in the final piece. And the final thing that we did to test this is we put a time code at the bottom. And what that enabled us to do is just to see was everything in sync exactly the way we wanted. And once we got it to be there, we knew that we had what we needed. So hopefully what you see from what I've been talking about in these three projects is I'm a, I'm a huge believer in, in, in the marrying together of technology and storytellers and getting them working together from the onset to produce these kinds of nonlinear kind of interactive stories across any type of platform. And, you know, I, I did want to say this is a one new project I can't talk too much about, but we're, it's going to uh, launch in June. And just what's interesting about it is it's a uh, reality show but it kind of has a kind of live streamed like re social viewing element to it. So the show will be impacted in real time by what's happening out there on the Twitter and Facebook universe. Uh, so in closing, I have uh, two points that I kind of wanted to share here. Uh, one is that uh, as I kind of hit over the head is that I think uh, one is content producers, we need to embrace technology more and embrace technologists as part of the creative process. And I think uh, the last one is that uh, while I have all you uh, technologists here is that uh, I think we need to learn a little bit from uh, Gary and Wyatt and uh, create our own kind of weird science and, uh, you know, have a little, it's, a, it's an exciting time. Let's, you know, not be too precious with our technology. Let's work together with open arms and, you know, let's have some fun with it. Let's put bras on our head. Let's do whatever we need to do to kind of uh, produce the next, you know, kind of weird science. So I think... Uh, you know, as I close out, I just want to say I'll, I'll be around and I hope to uh, meet a lot of you and uh, have the opportunity to uh, kind of uh, see where we can push things uh, from a creative and technology side. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. That was, that was great. Uh, I have questions I'm writing down, but we'll save them all for the end. And I think we're going to have enough time. Look, you guys are very efficient. Um, so Michael Payne is our next speaker. And he's the director of a unit of Intel Labs called Interaction and Experience Research. Um, Michael himself is a human factor psychologist, and other members of his team include anthropologists, ethnographers, designers, social scientists, and various types of engineers. So this is a multidisciplinary activity that's really not tied to the specific products uh, as much as it is the, the whole area of interaction for users. Uh, before Intel, Michael worked on uh, human factors engineering problems for uh, confronted in combat and nuclear power management, so those are almost as important as television. And uh, he will present to us now. Thank you very much. Uh, so Mike Payne, one of the things I always have to do is sort of level set when I talk. Um, coming from Intel, most people expect that 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology, how our capabilities, you know, sort of enable the next generation of TV, and that, that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm, uh, you know, as Nick mentioned, I'm a psychologist, human factors engineer, as they like to call me at Intel. Uh, we have a team of anthropologists who are doing research around the world on a daily basis with people to understand what they're doing uh, in their daily lives, their social connections, where they're placing value, how they're engaging with technology, and most importantly, why. Uh, if we understand why people are doing what they're doing, we can help to extrapolate that to the types of things they'll value in new experiences moving forward. So our organization at Intel is focused across the board, uh, not just on television, but uh, I in particular for the last uh, four or five years have had a, a very strong focus on TV, uh, and we've had a core team that's focused in that space. And today I want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of uh, people's changing, oops, you don't want to see that. Uh, what you're seeing in terms of people's changing relationship with TV, one of the things we knew uh, from a long time ago when we, set up, when we set about looking at what it meant to bring the internet to the TV is retaining what people love about television. It's not about just bringing you know, a browser and what people love you know, with regard to the internet from other platforms to TV. It's about building upon what people truly love with TV. And what's been really interesting over the last few years is to see the evolution of how people are interacting with television. Forget the box, uh, but the content. And what I love about the two talks we just saw is the creativity that's going into building new experiences, creating new types of content. The types of capabilities and experiences that I want to talk about today are going to be unleashed with this type of innovation uh, coming together with the technology. So I love what we just saw. Uh, and I think today I want to get a little bit into what we see uh, as the next set of things that people are valuing TV. I also want to be very real. Uh, I want to be very realistic about where we are and where we're not with smart television. Because I think that we have a big vision and I think we have a long way to go to realize that vision. It's going to take all of us here from technology to content industry to creatives to bring that story to life for people. So I'm going to start with a video. Uh, that one of our senior anthropologists, Alex Zafiroglu, um, took on a recent trip. So you're going to see three stories here, um, one from Japan, the UK, and the US. This is a woman in Tokyo who is driving, watching television in the car. She had her mechanic override it. You're not supposed to be able to watch it unless you're stopped. Uh, so this is a day in the life of this family. So it's starting out showing a little bit of TV watching uh, in the car. Uh, in a moment, we're going to flash over, and you're going to see the same woman, now folding laundry, watching television. Now she's in the kitchen. This was a custom-built kitchen design so that she could open up to watch television in the other room. Actually built it specifically for TV viewing. Uh, so as the day evolves, um, you know, I saw a stat upstairs in the quantitative session earlier that said TV, people are watching TV 11 hours a day, which is even more than uh, my recent stats show. Um, but this is crazy. And this, this family, again, watching TV in front of the tele uh, eating dinner in front of the television, and pretty soon you're going to see probably the most disturbing aspect of this is, uh, you know, a foot rub uh, while watching TV in the bedroom at night. Um, and it just shows the day in the life of television. It revolves from room to room to place to place, from automobile to home, kitchen, and all sorts of activities ha happening in conjunction uh, with television watching. Now what we're going to see, and there is volume here, I don't know if somebody's controlling that, but if we could pump the volume up a little bit. I'm on the couch on my laptop. I had my email open. My calendar open, my Facebook open, I have some schoolwork open, and Catan, uh, and often will also be playing chess on Facebook, uh, watching TV, and Chris is sitting a little further away from me than he normally does, but uh, he's over in the chair here. Uh, he doesn't have his netbook here right now, it's over at uh, his dad's house, but uh, usually he does have his netbook as well. Uh, Clark uh, is not on his computer right now, he's just watching TV, although I wouldn't be surprised if he starts responding to some text messages. Uh, and these are the only people home right now, so that's all we're doing while we're watching TV right now. On Sunday afternoon. That's it. On Sunday that's all afternoon. they're doing while they're watching TV. Final story from the UK. As it happens, you asked me to uh, capture when I was going to use iPlayer. Now, I didn't think I was going to use it, if I'm honest, between then and now. But it's Friday night. It's now half past ten. Uh, Friday night. We've been out for drinks after work. But anyway, we're going to watch, uh, obviously, EastEnders, because we missed it. Um, 
I know that's sad, don't tell anyone, but um, I'm going to watch that on the computer, so I'm just getting that now, so I'll show you. Uh, so, I've heard it's a good episode tonight. I'm not going to bore you with the story. I've been reading about it on Facebook. I only that because I read it on Facebook, as George just said. Here we go. Now, look, I don't want to talk to EastEnders because that, that's a waste, obviously. But look, look, here we go. We're setting this up now. And no sound. Oh, no sound. Problem number one no sound. Oh, what a pickle. We've got iTunes playing and everything. Problem number two another application running, overtaking his television on the PC. Problem number three, they're not even at the right place to watch the show they wanted to sit down to watch. So what I love about these three stories is they really articulate the range of experiences people are having around television. Obviously in the last example, um, and something they, they articulated is the only reason they're watching it on the PC is because they can't get that type of catch-up television on the actual television. They'd much prefer to sit down in front of the TV when they get home and watch it. They have a television, but they're watching it on the PC because they can't. Uh, within those three examples, we see the range of you know, multi-device use, uh, multi use to watch television. We see uh, social interaction driving the content and knowing what's on in EastEnders at the show. We see all kinds of changes in the way that people's relationships uh, are evolving with television. And one of the things that, that I want to point out here is, is the reality of where we're at. I think as an industry, we should all be very proud of where we're at in terms of driving internet-connected television and the smart TV revolution. But if we take a step back, we've only come a very small way in delivering something uh, that people truly love. The fact is, people could walk away from internet-connected television today and not lose a lot of sleep. Uh, nowhere close to what they're feeling about linear television and the draw they have to that on an ongoing basis. If we want to get people to the point where if you strip that internet connection out of their television, they no longer believe it's television, we've got a ways to go. And there's some critical things that are important to do that. Uh, one is that we've merged internet onto the TV. We have applications, we have some new content through Netflix and other providers, but we haven't integrated it. There's no integration between what I'm watching on television and the internet content or social connections that I might want to have that, that are related to that. The fact is that about 80% of people today uh, are doing something on a mobile device in front of the television. We're making no use of it. Uh, about 15 to 20 percent of those people are also doing something related to television uh, while on that mobile device in front of the TV. And there's no connection. There's no integration between the stories that people love and the other things that are related to that. And we have a huge opportunity to tie those things together to drive a real, uh, a, a new sense of experience between what people are watching and the types of things they're doing in relationship to that content. Uh, second, new, new social experiences. So it's very interesting. We're now driving Twitter feeds and Facebook and some amount of video calling to the television. It's all a good start, but it isn't doing what, what people fundamentally care about when you think about their social connections. They want a sense of presence, especially around the television. Give me a sense of presence, and that doesn't mean that it has to be uh, a video call and I have to see your face. We can think about asynchronous social connections related to the content that people are watching. Allow me to drop a note on a piece of content so that when you see that piece of content, you can see what I was talking about. It's not just about recommendations, and it's not just about what's seeing what people are feeding through the typical social internet channels. It's about connecting people around the things that they're doing in their lives and around the content that they're viewing. Advanced UIs and remotes. And this is something that is going to prevent us from moving forward if we don't get this right. And I love the two examples we saw here on stage today because they're really pushing the boundaries of how we create the content and how we create the interfaces that allow us to navigate and enjoy that content. And we have to fundamentally change the UI paradigm and the remote paradigm to make this happen. Using smartphones and tablets is a big part of this, but fundamentally the remote control is the thing that's always there in front of the television. 
And unless we get that right and we fundamentally change it, and that's, that takes cost structure change, it takes a whole bunch of things. But voice integration so that I can use my voice to search for content, touch integration so that I can smoothly move through UIs, gesture for gaming and other interactions, and finally, the integration of a keyboard in some way so that I can type when I don't want to use voice to search and other things is critical, all in a one-handed remote. And we fundamentally got to change that experience if we're going to unleash the type of experiences uh, that we've heard about here earlier today in terms of interacting between these things. Uh, and finally, cross-screen interaction. I talked a little bit about it, and I'm going to show you a video uh, a little bit later that talks about our mobile, our vision for mobile TV uh, internet interaction. So one of the things that is, is important to us and the things that we constantly harp upon is that this thing needs to know me. I've heard it. I love it. In the, in the, in the sessions that I've been in today, I've heard personalization no less than, than 10 times, 15 maybe. And I imagine throughout the course of the next two days, we're going to hear it many more times. Because TV is a very social experience, and yet people have a very personal relationship with it. And whether it's you in front of the TV alone, or you with another person, with a child, you with a, a spouse, a friend, the relationship that you have jointly with that television needs to change. The recommendations, the way you discover content, the types of things that are appropriate, we need to get to a point where the TV knows you. And it's not just about the television knowing you, it's about the ecosystem of content and services understanding me, what I'm doing throughout the day, regardless of the device that I'm on, so that I'm not just prioritizing a set of recommendations and things that I can discover and do on television based on what I do when I'm in front of the television. The fact is, for the most part of the day, I'm away from the television. We need to understand what's happening with people throughout the course of a day in order to allow them a personal experience on the television and the other devices in which they're engaging in. One view into all content. This really gets to the fact that today you have to change input mechanisms on the TV to get from, the, to, to get from your gaming station to Netflix to uh, your, your linear content, your personal content. We have to get to the point where we're both allowing the integration of content so that I can see one view into what's available to me and also making it easy as one button to get to that content, not thinking about input channels and other things. So there's both things with regard to opening content doors and business models as well as unlocking you know, new types of technology solutions that allow us to, to have that type of ease of interaction. Uh, fun, natural, and easy ways to interact. And I think this gets to, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Um, I've said a little bit about it before, but the interface and the types of ways, one of the things that we've locked people into this guide, we've increased the content by so much, and you constantly hear 300, you know, 300 channels and nothing on. Um, and people are forced to a, a text-based guide where they navigate through things, looking at what might be on, and it's, it's extremely boring. There's no fun to it. They're not, one of the things that used to be fun about channel surfing when you had 12 stations is I could just channel up and down, and it was a quick, you know, quick move through it. Now everybody goes for a baseline. If it doesn't take more than you know, a second or two to, to get between digital channel to digital channel, it's OK. Well, the fact is we force people to go to a guide, get away from visual browsing. We need to find a way back to allow them to visually preview their content uh, and there's a lot of opportunity through multi-video pane uh, viewing and interactivity paired with new types of uh, remote controls that are going to allow people to really uh, find new ways to have fun in discovering their content and get away from the guide as we know it today. Context-relevant discoveries. Again, this has everything to people finding and discovering new content and tying it to the other things they might want to do has everything to do with understanding what you're watching on television, understanding who's in the room, what you might want to be doing based on what you were doing last time you sat down with the group of people you sat down. Context is critical uh, to moving this, this type of TV experience forward. Uh, and finally, access inside content. One of the things that we know is that if you could l uh, unleash content with metadata, with video analytics and other things, and allow people to actually dive into the content they're watching, find their own view into it, get to related content in sporting events and not have it just dictated to them, really merging this sense of what we know about the interactivity related to internet content today versus the linear nature of TV viewing. If you merge those two together, there's something really powerful there. So the last thing I want to show uh, is a video that, that provides a little bit of insight into our perspective on the future of uh, mobile TV interaction. There's a lot to be said for taking the things that I just talked about within the TV experience alone and breaking those things into an experience that allows somebody to have a deeper level of interactivity with social connections, uh, with uh, discovery of new content, with having a personal uh, look into what's available to you while there's still a social experience in front of the entire television so you're not ruining that experience for everybody else. And it goes much beyond just throwing a video to the TV or using the, the, the tablet or the smartphone 
as a, as a smart controller, there's a much deeper level of integration that can happen to really drive new forward-looking experiences. So I'll play this, and then uh, I think we'll be ready to, to open it up for questions. Seeing in the foreground is the tablet, in the background is the TV. So imagine you have this deeper sort of level of integration and personalization on the tablet where I can actually have that level of interactivity and looking through the content available to me. I can discover things that are recommended based on the things that, that I'm interested in, the people who are with me. I can send that to the television. So it's really about mixing that, that sense of personal discovery through mobile device interaction with what's view, being viewed socially by everybody in the room. In this particular example, what you're seeing is you're seeing a tablet experience in the front that's sort of feeding social, uh, uh, social communication around what people are watching on TV. And at the bottom, you see this ticker. And what's happening along that ticker on the tablet is that people are dropping social comments. Um, so that at any point along the way in a video, I can see what a buddy of mine or somebody else that I've decided is, you know, dropping in stream comments, I can see what they're talking about at the content at any point in time, and I can navigate directly to it. So it's not just about a recommendation, it's not about just a blind Twitter feed, it's about really integrating the things that people are talking about um, at certain contexts in the show. And you can imagine the things that you think about when you're watching television, uh, tying into what you might want to say to other people. In this particular example, we're looking at the ability to really control your angle, your view, and sort of 3D model some of the things that you're seeing in replays at sporting events. Um, and having that level of control, some amount of that may happen on the television, but there's also some really interesting things that we can be doing to give people that type of control if we have the right connection between the TV and the tablet uh, on that mobile device. This one, a little bit more of a stretch for me. I think there's something to be said, and we see in the research that there's some interest in this notion of, of co-planning and being able to have you know, sort of an intricate look at what you're doing on a mobile device, co-plan an experience together with people. You see video calling in the background, sort of joint recommendations from the friends that you might be planning a trip with, sort of being realized in that big screen social experience while your personal uh, look into that is on the, on the small screen. And the final example, that we're gonna see here in just a second is a look at what you can do when you start to bring the power of multiple mobile devices together with the television to look at a whole new way of thinking about gaming and interaction. Here what you're seeing is a personal view of you know, a first person type shooter game on the tablet coming together with a joint view of the overall game on the television. And this involves a tremendous amount of performance linkage and game design uh, to bring this to, to reality. But there's a whole set of interesting things that we should be thinking about with regard to mobile TV interaction. Um, and it's all based on, you know, one of the things that's most important to understand is that out of the research that we're driving and the research that I saw upstairs earlier this morning, it tells us a whole lot about what people are doing. And through the, the types of research that we do to really get into people's homes and lives to understand why they're doing it, we can really extrapolate to what they might value. Um, people are not out there saying, hey, I want all the stuff that I've just shown you here today. But we do know is based on what they are doing and where they're placing their value and their money and their interactions today, there's a level of what we believe there's serious value in delivering these types of things. You're bringing, you're, you're bringing new experiences to things they already care about and you're building on top of those to create incredibly interesting uh, experiences for them. So with that said, I think, I think we're ready for questions. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for all the panelists. We, we just have time for a couple questions, so I won't ask mine. I'll let you ask yours. Someone have one? Right in the middle there. Yes, sir. I don't think. Did we get it? Uh, hey, I'm back. I, I picked up some of it. So I just wondering what, what impacted uh, consoles the, and some like No, specifically have. the Microsoft Connect technology Microsoft where you Connect. don't have to touch anything. There's no controller. It's just hand gestures, everything. Absolutely. I mean, I think games consoles generally are going to be, you know, massive 
areas for us in the future. Uh, and our guys already are doing an awful lot of work around uh, working on gesture-based controls, um, voice-activated controls, and, and making them match up with the existing kind of remote controls and the handheld devices that are already there. So, so yeah, I imagine it's going to be massive. Um, we will be having a, tomorrow at this session, at 2.30 tomorrow afternoon, some look at the gestural stuff, so you can come back. And I also think it's, it's being used on the content side as well in that, I mean, obviously for games on the Xbox 360, but, uh, you know, I know our directors are already, we're in the midst of, of doing some tests where it's integrating live action with the depth that you're getting, you know, from the Kinect and matching, marrying like 3D with live action in real time to kind of see what kind of content you can produce and then allow people to interact with that using, you know, just real base. So I think it, it comes from both, both sides. Somebody else have a question? Well, I have one. I'm curious uh, what each of you or any of you what might think about whether or not we, how long it will take to actually see some of the integration we're talking about, where the development that you're doing on the actual program, which typically it seems to me is on a single platform because it's so complicated to take care of the back end and actually create the, the experience, will be uh, deployed on you know, all of these things simultaneously. I think it's going to happen, it, it's going to take time, it's going to come in chunks, right? And the nice thing is that people are experimenting and pushing these things in all levels. You see some of that experimenting coming in the new TV solutions that are out. You see a lot of experimentation on the mobile devices and even on PCs with how content's being created, the types of social interactions. I think this is all pushing the industry in the right direction. I think to connect and the other, you know, device manufacturers that are putting out new types of remotes that allow experimentation in that regard uh, are going to take us a long way. So I think it's going to happen. It's going to take. A, it's going to be a long road, but I think over the next year or two, we're going to see some pretty brilliant things come out in that regard. Year and a half. Anybody else has a guess? <laughs> Any other questions from our? Oh, go ahead. Questions from the audience. They've dazzled you. You're. You have no questions left. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, sir. And now we're reinvigorating. Oh, the, the music videos had gone passe, and now we're reinvigorating them. I was in Brazil, and there's music videos everywhere, and they're a much bigger form of communication. I'm just trying to understand do you see music videos coming as much more important? Perhaps you could talk about that. Well, I, I think I'm, I'm specifically talking about the in the United States. I mean, obviously, MTV is no longer showing them. I think even when you look at YouTube for a while, the top 10 videos would typically be music videos, but in, I was talking to a buddy who's a music executive and he was saying they're freaking out about all the other things that they've already been worried about, but now if you look at the top 10 list, music videos maybe only take up three or four spots in the top 10. So there's a deterioration in what people are viewing and I think that, you know, it just came out the other day, uh, Chris Milk and Aaron Koblen just did this interactive WebGL based interactive music video for the new uh, uh, Rome album that's coming out and the buzz that you get from that, you know, just people talking about it and actually thinking about things in a, in a way that, feeling at things in a way that they haven't felt. You know, I used to, I remember music videos from back in the 80s. There hasn't been a music video that's necessarily I've connected with in the past, you know, five years. And I think that the ones that I remember and I see people talking about now are more in the realm of interactive music videos. I'm not saying that linear music videos are going by the wayside. I'm just saying that particularly in the context of what we're talking about, interactive television and, and viewing, to me there's a huge opportunity to allow people to interact and kind of, you know, feel and, and, and expand on the music and the experience and the story that's being told at the same time as, as, as you're viewing it and listening to the music. Well, we're getting a frantic wrap it up signal here, so uh, the only other thing I would say, if you're interested in interactive videos, you might want to take a look at what Arcade Fire did last year, which is pretty amazing. With the, the, same, the same group just came out with this role. Yeah. Um, well, that's it for, for this session. We'll be doing another creative session tomorrow at 2.30, 2.45. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us back here in one hour.